Mm -hmm. would, would you come up to the uh, microphone and please introduce yourself? <laughs> Don Palmer. I, I uh, loved everything you had to say, uh, Gregory, and just wanted to help you find a place to save Darwin, the early Darwin, a little bit from mm -hmm. condemnation. These are paraphrases since I didn't bring The Descent of Man. But um, in The Descent of Man, when reminding us that people have objected to his theory because they said they did not want to be seen as descending from monkeys. He said, I would rather be descended from a small monkey that feeds its children and protects his wife than a drunken Englishman who returns home from the public house to beat his wife and terrorize his children. <laughs> so I, I think that cuts a little across that barrier. And, Frontier, and then another idea of my uh, that I've always been uh, pleased with in Darwin uh, is not about this, but I think applies to virtually all of these uh, of boundaries that you were talking about. Um, he says, amazingly, the man who wrote a book called *The Origin of Species* says the attempt to distinguish among species is like the attempt to define the difference between a town and a village. In other words, there we also have some elbow room. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I, I, I mean, nothing gives me greater pleasure than Darwinian exegetics. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, no, the, both of those, the, both of those passages. I didn't know the, the latter one, but both both of those that you uh, touch upon bring out important aspects of, of his position. Uh, and this goes back to, to uh, some of what Lynn was talking about with regard to the instability of the boundary line between the, the, humans, uh, the human and the, and the non-human. Uh, just at the very end of The Descent of Man, he, he has a passage much like the first one that you recalled, but it's a bit more um, uh, robust in that it's not a drunken Englishman, but the Fuegians. Uh, and uh, his encounter with the Fuegians uh, on the Beagle Voyage clearly shocked him in a kind of permanent way. Uh, and at the end of the book, he, at the end of the book, he, he recalls uh, his, uh, the sensation of watching these people paint bedaubed, naked, uh, uh, frothing at the mouths, uh, and the feeling that uh, if it was a choice between them as ancestral, or his ancestors being like them as they must have been, uh, killing their infants, um, and the noble monkey that he told us about earlier in the book. Uh, and uh, so stories of animals being more moral than we are inclined to think, of humans being less moral than we, than we incline to think, were important for him. Uh, and he comes at them right at the end of the book in order to remind the reader that as exalted as human beings have become, uh, they still bear the indelible stamp of their lowly origins. Uh, and that instability between the lowest savage and the highest animal it figures as part of that, that uh, discussion. The, the point about um, species and varieties is fascinating and important for him because he has a long and rather complex discussion in the book about whether it is the case that the different human races ought to be understood as different varieties of one species or as different species. And this is a morally loaded question for Darwin, less so by 1871 than before. But especially, I was reminded by Lynn's talk and, and what she said about British anti-slavery. Uh, there is a letter that Darwin wrote in 1850 uh, to a friend of his about a, a lecture by uh, Louis Agassiz given in, uh, I believe it was South Carolina, in which he says, I see Agassiz has been lecturing again on the separate races uh, the separate species of the human races. So Agassiz thought the different, uh, the different human races were autochthonous separate species. And he said, Darwin adds, much to the comfort of the southern slaveholders. And it, it's, it, I think it's a very revealing comment because it suggests that for him, uh, this wasn't a politically neutral question, uh, just to, as, as Lynn was saying, that to, to assign uh, black slaves to something other than the category of human was to make it that bit easier to legitimate their cruel treatment, which he found absolutely 
uh, abhorrent. So uh, that, that in, in general, the, the town-village analogy worked for Darwin very much. But in the human case, more was at stake than with other, than with other uh, creatures. Could you repeat that, projecting that? Monkeys, microcephalous idiots, and the barbarous races of mankind. That's from the descent of man. Right, right. Cynthia? Cindy Hamovic, uh, fellow here at the center. I have a question for you, Lynn, and I should have probably asked you this earlier because I don't know if you can answer it, but um, I wonder what happens to your theorists who are thinking about the nature of humanity in relation to slavery after abolition. And I ask this in part because I recently read uh, Hussey's book, Freedom Burning, mm -hmm. uh, in which he argues that Britain was, a, was in the 19th century a fervently anti-slavery nation, but not an abolitionist nation, by which he means that they were uh, came to believe that um, humanity and slavery were incompatible, but at the same time they accepted a broad range of um, forms of forced labor uh, for increasingly for people of color only. And of course, as you know, I'm working on the uh, a history of the uh, coolie trade in the 19th century. And the British, of course, create this massive system of indentured servitude in their colonies all over the world. 10 million people moved here and there. Um, imagining those people as free, uh, free laborers who have cho chosen these indentures, yet at the same time they impose a whole series of criminal penal sanctions for violations of civil labor laws so that, you know, for something like quitting or striking or insolence or just not finishing your work for the day, you could be imprisoned or deported um, or most likely flogged, right? So we have 25% like of coolies being flogged. Um, so how do you reconcile the, the sort of debates that you're describing for the slavery period with the real fuzziness of these definitions in the post-emancipation mm -hmm. period? Um, yeah, I mean, th in the period I'm looking at, it's still a question really very much of the abolition of the slave trade and not of yeah. emancipation in any way, right? So part of what's interesting and, and quite sinister in the debates is the, the way in which um, the notion of abolishing the trade is actually uh, explicitly theorized by the parliamentarians as a way of instituting forms of labor that, that will be, in fact, more efficacious. Um, right, there's a, an absolutely repellent um, intertwining the kind of sentimental discourse I was talking about with the notion that um, in stating sort of uh, sentimental family, you know, bonds, um, it, it sort of a kind of casual beneficence will in fact produce labor, laborers who, you know, embrace, the, you know, the, the, the forced servitude um, with sort of a readiness that, that is not available to somebody enslaved. I mean, there's also a kind of re-theorization of the way slavery actually diminishes human beings to the point that they become less good laborers, less good workers, which tracks back into Adam Smith and other people. Um, I mean, emancipation is quite a, quite a ways down the road from, you know, the trade doesn't get abolished until, you know, 1808. We don't get abolition in the, in the British colonies until 38. Um, so you're, you're witnessing... Um, something that's quite isolated around a kind of form of human trafficking rather than actually reinstitution of the modes of labor. Um, uh, you know, that set, and uh, the questions around um, labor at, in the 1790s, right, are lodged not only around notions of African slavery, but also with the kind of compare and contrast of forms of forced servitude internal to Britain. And of course, many people have argued that the abolition is basically kind of look, look here, look here, so as not to attend to internecine disputes within Great Britain. It's a way of actually um, soldering over internal political dissension um, and getting around difficulties, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of workers' activism. There's, you know, all sorts of things, militant action in Great Britain on the part of um, workers who are internal to the aisles, and so there's a sense in which this telescopic philanthropy and this attention is a way of deflecting um, those questions of labor which are both immediately, right, before the abolitionist eyes um, in Great Britain and, and aren't 
entirely revolving around questions of, of race. I, I don't think I quite got to your question, but I think that actually the, these notions of abolition um, and the turning outward of empire, right, it creates a kind of um, moral sanction for forms of exploitation that aren't as overtly registered, and so we're witnessing that. Um, in terms of the thinkers, just to add one final note, I mean, part of what's really interesting about many of the most um, uh, racist, uh, you know, anticipations of really, um, of really deeply steeped racist theories like Buffon. Um, part of what's very interesting about 18th century thinkers is how inconsistent they are, right, in the espousal of their ideologies. Um, when they move from one text to another, they kind of um, take on and drop um, the theories that they say espouse in a natural history. I'm thinking of people like Voltaire, Renal, uh, even Diderot at moments. Um, there's a sense in which the relations they take to slavery become dissevered from race when it's convenient, um, often as a reflection of the genre in which they're writing. So Voltaire, who's a polygenicist, right, um, who uh, you know takes on some of the more um, repellent theories, particularly of Buffon and degeneration, um, also is the author of the most one of the most stirring portraits of anti-slavery, right, in Candide. Um, so there's something very there's not a consistency of theorizing operating at this early moment. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Russell, and then... Hi, so I, I was just wondering if Greg could say a little bit more about how he sees sort of Darwinian theory as influencing or otherwise figuring into uh, the views of the, you know, uh, of Singer and other people uh, who talk about the expanding circle, because on the face of things, whether you take a Singer-type view of the expanding circle or some other moral philosophical view, there are no Darwinian premises in those arguments, right? So the arguments are that, well, here, there's something we're call, call, calling moral status. It's based on the possession of certain subject-centered properties, like sentience, capacities for pleasure and pain, which give rise to interest, personhood, capacities, whatever. Um, and that's what grounds moral status. It doesn't matter what the ideology is of those capacities. So if Darwinian theory tells us, well, this is the causal historical explanation of, of where those capacities came from. Um, okay, that's all fine and good, uh, but it, it in fact doesn't matter because their arguments don't depend on any Darwinian premises, which are historical premises. Um, uh, they just care about the possession of, of those capacities and the fact that certain species, uh, you know, biological categories like species membership or genomes or whatever, these are all these bio descriptive biological categories that don't have any uh, uh, obvious relevance to grounding moral status. They look like they're arbitrary bases for moral discrimination. And so I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about how you think the sort of the Darwinian framework fits into the expanding uh, circle of philosophy. Well, that's a, a, a great question. And I, I only attend as, a, as an interested outsider in the debates among my philosophical colleagues about what to do with G.E. Moore's naturalistic fallacy. Uh, but uh, it's an interesting moment for those debates. So, so G.E. Moore in the early 20th century announced that everybody up to G.E. Moore uh, had been making a logical fallacy uh, in uh, drawing conclusions about values from factual premises. And, and Hume is often, uh, a passage from Hume is picked out as an antecedent for this, view, uh, for this view. It turns out that what Hume says is a little bit uh, uh, ambiguous, uh, but uh, Moore was reacting uh, quite explicitly against the great Darwinian philosopher of the 19th century, Herbert Spencer. I mean, there's almost a sense in which analytical philosophy is a repudiation of the synthetic philosophy, which was Herbert Spencer's. Uh, and so to be a house-trained analytic philosopher is to, to have Moore looking over your shoulder when you try to think, what have I got to learn from Darwinism in my ethical theorizing? And uh, Singer's book is fascinating, not least because he's aware of that. Uh, he, he's aware that one ought not to draw value conclusions from factual bases, and yet he thinks it's absolutely vital uh, to try to put these things together. Uh, the most explicit reflections I've seen on the question are uh, Philip Kitcher's. Uh, and I, if I recall, borrowing a, a phrase from, from E.O. Wilson, he, he declares there to be four ways of biologicizing ethics, um, two of which are, are non-starters. But he, he doesn't conclude that the only thing that uh, an ethical uh, philosopher can learn from Darwinian theory is a causal story, which might be of interest, but doesn't actually figure in the premises uh, of an argument. 
Uh, what, I, what I recall anyway is that Kitcher thought there might be some bleed through, uh, not least in showing that certain, uh, what, what we might have thought of as, as certain options turn out to be non-options, but uh, at, at that, I can't remember the details. But Kitcher was definitely of the view that it was too quick to, de to declare a kind of wall between one's value theorizing and uh, the conclusions of natural science and history. Nobody has mentioned uh, the role of missionaries in uh, contesting certain aspects of Darwinism and uh, trying to go up the waterfall in lifting up certain people, but by doing that, really having uh, difficulties with the extension of empire, um, the abolitionists, um, and going into territories where they didn't want to go, but you know they were ultimately responsible for the demise of the Fuegans because they dressed them, because they put clothes on them, they died of pneumonia. So um, I'd like to know, you know, your thoughts on uh, allowing missionaries into the empire and what role they played in the initial movement, in the human uh, rights movement. Just be, before you leave the mic, I just, I couldn't quite tell from your remarks whether you were speaking in favor of the missionaries? I'm just or? asking uh, uh, for your ideas. I mean, I think they are ambiguous and uh, they will always be ambiguous. So if you have any thoughts, I think it would help clarify their ambiguity. Well, before I launch in, I just want to see whether Lynn, uh, whether this is, uh, whether missionaries matter for, for, for 18th century. Well, yeah, I mean, many of the very early um, reports on the Caribbean, of course, are, particularly the French Caribbean, are written by French priests such as Duterte um, and any number of others, um, often uh, who, despite their religious beliefs and despite the slightly different policies about Christianization that were uh, part of the Code Noir. <laughs> Um, describe basically without any compunction um, relations of torture and exploitation um, that then get picked up. I mean, part of what's very interesting um, is that notwithstanding the kind of secular genealogies of human rights that we've been, you know, sort of uh, focusing on in many ways, um, the, the theorization of um, racial discourses is very much shaped by reports that are coming from um, not explicitly missionaries, but um, but religious priests who are reporting back from the colonies and are whose discourses are very much shaped by those assumptions. Well, um, Dar Darwin had no problem with missionaries. That's a contrast with Franz Boas, who I talked about, uh, who regarded uh, missionaries as entirely untrustworthy as informants about peoples in other parts of the world. He thought, not least in, in, when it came to telling us about their languages, that they, because they weren't trained, they didn't sufficiently divest themselves of their own linguistic habits and linguistic uh, uh, world. Uh, and so all of their information was tainted by their biases. Uh, Darwin, by contrast, doesn't have any systematic problem with missionaries. On the contrary, he contributes money to the missionary societies. There's even a myth circulating in the missionary world now, which is a kind of counterpart to the standard Darwin deathbed conversion story. And the missionary story says that um, near the end of his life, uh, on being given a dictionary of the Fuegian language uh, produced by, by missionaries, Darwin was so astonished to discover that they had enough of a language that a dictionary could be built around it that he declared that he'd been grossly mistaken in putting them so low in the scale before. Uh, and uh, the letter in which he says this uh, now circulates as a, a sense of Darwin repudiating his former self thanks to the missionaries. Again, when you look at it in detail, it's not like that at all. It, it, the, the guy who had written to him initially was a friend, and, and he just wrote back in a friendly way, more or less to say, you guys have done fantastic work. Uh, I never dreamed anyone could have done so much uh, with the Fuegians, thinking about you know, the awful experience that, that he'd had down there. Uh, but um, uh, he, he relied on missionaries uh, often for, for information. Uh, his very first publication uh, with uh, Robert um, uh, Fitz, uh, the captain of the Beagle, uh, Fitzroy, thank you, with, uh, with Robert Fitzroy, was on behalf of the good work the missionaries had been doing in Tahiti. Uh, 
the moral status of the, the, of the Tahitian. So uh, at least in the beginning, missionaries and Darwinism were, were hand, in, hand in glove. Uh, it, it really, the, the relationship between scientists and missionaries really only comes apart in the 20th century with the rise of professional anthropologists. Can I just add one note, I mean, which is that the centrality of Christianity in legitimating enslavement, right, reminds us that the modes of humanity that we're ratcheting in and out, right, have everything to do with also sort of a soul-saving aspect that, that enters into things. Gentlemen here. Uh, I think this might be one for Gregory, but I'm just thinking back about um, some of the early uh, Darwinians. Darwin himself was not given and was careful to kind of keep a detachment from, I think, the spirit religious establishment. But some of his colleagues and associates were not. And of course, his material very rapidly galvanized whole society-wide uproar. Um, one of the things that uh, came up was um, the issue of, uh, let's see now, Thomas, uh, I'm blocking this guy's name. Huxley? Huxley, thank you, <laughs> who proposed the idea that with the ad advent of mind uh, that the process of evolution had to be thought of in some different way. And he, he, he was, did not bring Charles Darwin into this spirit of thought very enthusiastically at all, but he did manage to get it out. And it seems to me that we really need to remember that there may be a lot of truth to his position. It was widely debated at this time. The idea that with the advent of life and consciousness and mind, evolution could actually understand itself and change its own direction somewhat. And that this really meant that we were dealing with something quite different than organic evolution that was usually associated with Darwin. We hardly ever keep this in mind today. All these Darwinian gurus that are running around, they talk about Darwin, and they talk about you know, this one sort of focused, sort of organic Darwin often, and they forget that this other kind of Darwin evolution could, co could influence the uh, mo mobilization of culture, could even produce the golden rule. This is not something that the uh, pre-Darwinian or pre-cognitive uh, evolutionary theories would have imagined. So just a question. Um, how can we think of the distinction or discrimination in evolutionary process, a kind of evolved evolution, in relationship to the subject matter of your group? Well, I'm, I'm so pleased that you brought this up because the, the view that you rightly associate with Thomas Huxley, for all that he's considered Darwin's bulldog, which in certain ways you know, he certainly was, uh, but uh, that, that view is often called a saltational evolution. So evolution by leaps. In The Origin of Species, Darwin quoted Linnaeus uh, to say that nature makes no leaps. But Huxley, right away, uh, in the early 1860s, I mean, and, I mean, even in 1859, one of the first letters Darwin got about the book, wrote to Darwin to say, love the book, but you know, why do you make this hostage to fortune about nature making no leaps? And very early on, Huxley, in lecturing about Darwinism, would say that it was entirely possible that uh, gradual change at the micro level might have cascading causal effects on an organism such that you got much larger scale change at the macro level. And Huxley didn't see any reason to be dogmatic about whether that didn't happen. Uh, and throughout the 19th century, very important thinkers, uh, including Francis Galton, uh, backed a saltational, a jumpy, rather than a gradualist vision of, of natural selection. And I didn't say this, but uh, Boaz, I mentioned as a kind of critical friend. As I read Boaz, rather, the most charitable way to make sense of what Boaz has to say on several topics is to see that he's a saltationist. When it, so he's not a creationist, but he doesn't think that um, natural change is gradual and adaptive in the ways that, that Darwin thought. Uh, and what I find so fascinating about the, the bit of Boaz that ends up underwriting uh, human rights uh, biologically in the mid 20th century is that it owes a lot to this moment in the early 20th century when it was okay for biological thinkers to be saltationist in ways that it will cease to be okay after the modern synthesis in the, the mid 20th century. Uh, in fairness, Stephen Jay Gould uh, 
did keep the saltationist option alive for, for many people uh, in, in the public domain. Uh, but right now, I, I, I can't think of anyone of any note who, who particularly wants to back that. But you're right, it's been a, a persistent uh, uh, alternative to a standard Darwinian line from, from the beginning, and, and may be so again. Could, could you, uh, if you're going to uh, keep it brief, please, and could you speak with the, with the microphone? Microphone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Empathy. empathy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, empathy, let's just say this much. Um, empathy was hard to explain by Darwinian selection, and, and um, it was, uh, it wouldn't seem to serve the survival of the individual. Uh, but anyway, that idea has been radically transformed in the last decade or so, and to the degree which the sociobiologist uh, E.O. Wilson, who was one of the early sociobiologists, renounced sociobiology and said it's now established that group selection is a si signal part of human evolution. So this is another one of these changes that fit into this kind of conversation, that our idea of the emergence of man is beginning to be quite radically transformed from this 19th century alpha male kind of stuff. I think we'll take another question. Did, did I say a question like that? No? Okay. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, yes. It's a, a question and a comment. I, I, I love particularly this manner to construct genealogy and reshaping of categories. But my question is, what about the efficiency of a category, the political efficiency of a category in its life, in its intellectual life? And I was uh, asking me, hearing you, if um, we could not apply a Brodelian vision of that, you know, the, the Brodelian vision of the two temporalities, the three temporalities, but, but with a, a, a very brief temporality, very quick temporality, which is the use of a category in the everyday life, of the everyday political life. For instance, uh, the relationship between uh, the French human rights and the Haitian revolution. Everybody used uh, homme, humain, during the, the, the Haitian revolution. It's a, it's a word which is a weapon, and that as a weapon is completely reshaped each day. And the second temporality, which is a more distant vision of uh, all that, is a, and the possibility to reconstruct, uh, reconstruct this, this different thing. And uh, uh, somebody like Abbé Grégoire, for instance, is exactly uh, uh, somebody with, between the two, uh, acting with a category in the everyday political life, and rethinking in his, uh, re in his uh, talks or in his uh, pamphlets uh, the manner to reshape that in a logical and more rational way. Um, that's, that's quite wonderful. Um, I mean, I think that there's a set of questions. I mean, it, it, part of what, what I'm really interested in, part of the reason I keep on stressing the literary is, uh, and the rhetorical is that I think it is precisely that reiteration of a term, right, that winds up instantiating things on a habitual basis in a way that recalibrates the kinds of ideas of the normative um, that then can be enacted, right, using different kinds of institutional structures. I mean, you can talk all you want and nothing may happen. Um, but, but to, um, you know, sort of uh, this notion that there's not only um, a, a rethinking of the habits of thought that revolves around these, um, the, rep the repetition and reiteration of words, um, but also a kind of anticipation of a utopian vision that starts to emerge that then can be something people act to realize, I think is very important. One of the things, though, that happens with the repetition of terms um, and with this notion of a certain form of learning is that such um, the insistence on humanity or the reiteration of certain words applied to humanity winds up smacking of the cliched or the stereotyped, um, right? That there's a kind of process in that, that in the habitual iteration of so-and-so as a man that winds up, and this is a point that Phil Fisher, I think, makes quite wonderfully, um, that is part of the hard cultural labor of re-adjudicating the, uh, readjusting these norms, 
but that the very fact that it entails such labor winds up denying the very humanity that it's insisting on, and that there's a certain moment, right, in which these things come to be seen as stereotypical because the very fact that they're insisting on has come to be accepted as a norm. Um, so there's a certain kind of obsolescence internal to these discourses in which, um, you know, the, the rehumanizing of women or slaves or, you know, various groups um, winds up actually producing a kind of um, backlash against that very labor which must be forgotten in order to institute these facts. Um, but I think you're right to, to stress that this, there's something important about the way we think about the temporality and I think also the ways we think about the way language actually gets picked up, perpetuated, and becomes performative by dint of the fact that certain institutions, you know, exist to perpetuate them. So um, there's a sense in which um, part of what's important for me about, and part of the reason I keep on returning to the parliamentary debates, um, notwithstanding the wide array of discussions about abolition, is that there's an institution there that's actually trying to affect something that will have a perdurable impact. So, one, one, one more Lynn, um, whoever designed the program for this conference and put together this panel and asked you to talk on it must have thought that it's quite important to start with the 18th century because something very important happens in the 18th century, that it's in the 18th century that certain new ideas about man uh, emerge and that this is new philosophy of man that uh, emerges throughout the 18th century it leads to the development of the notion of human rights as one of the central categories of the modern West. Now, I'm still not sure I know what you actually think about the philosophical and intellectual foundations of the uh, development of the notion of human rights in the 18th century. Um, okay. Are you asking whether what it is that actually um, makes the human a central focus? I mean, the, I mean that's such a, an immense question. <laughs> um, I would start, I mean, I, I obviously start with a set of questions, one could start with a set of questions about um, the Leviathan <laughs> um, and the, the theorization of certain state institutions that are designed to um, explain the emergence of humanity from a prior state of nature, which then does institute forms of natural right that gradually evolve towards the sorts of insistences on um, humanity and human rights later in the century. I, I would probably make an argument about the centrality of empiricism um, and a certain focus on um, the elaboration of uh, the, a, a focus on the uh, individual as a, um, uh, as a way of um, conceptualizing um, philosophical systems and um, isolating things in a way that allows for the divine to be turned to the side. Um, it's such a big question, I'm actually kind of struggling to answer it, but I think you're, you're um, right to say that, that the Enlightenment and the 18th century are, are triggering paradigmatic differences that are initiating something new. Um, could I yeah. push you on yeah. that uh, just a little bit more? <clears throat> uh, you know, the sources that you're talking about, uh, the Leviathan, uh, the sources that you talk about, the, the Leviathan, in you know, this um, uh, seminal statement of a sort of um, of secular uh, organizing principle um, for uh, for being and doing um, and governing, um, and empiricism, well, and the science um, and uh, individualism, it kind of comes back. It comes back again to the question that I raised in the earlier panel. Um, uh, there are alternative sources of thinking about uh, the human and the rights um, that accrue to that entity mm -hmm. um, that are very rich in uh, the 18th century and, and also um, have roots perhaps, you know, if, if the panel began not with the 18th century but with the 16th century or the 17th century with, for example, Jesuit conceptions of natural rights. Mm -hmm. um, and where does that genealogy, uh, how do you situate your account vis-a-vis -vis that genealogy which also has afterlives um, through the centuries uh, to the present and which in some regards may be more of a, 
fruitful basis for a conversation um, with uh, traditions that I gestured to in, in the earlier panel, um, uh, for example, Islamic uh, ways of envisaging and thinking about um, the human and the category of the human that, that may um, be able to have a more fruitful conversation with um, a, a tradition emanating from, uh, say, natural rights um, mm -hmm. and, and the more kind of, uh, yeah, if you could just pick that up, uh, pick up on that at all. I'm, I'm not sure. sure where to pick up on well, it. Well, basically, what are the um, um, what other potential sources do you see when you look at the literary scape of the 18th century? Um, you are uh, you are um, you weave together a very rich tapestry and picture mm -hmm. of um, a, a, a story of origins, um, as uh, Michael um, Lurie pointed out, um, for a tradition that continues to be very powerful a very powerful framework today. Um, but uh, what has been, um, what other traditions were there for talking about the human um, and rights and the, the rights that accrued to the, you know, you, this is alluded to in your uh, discussion of missionaries, um, right, and, and Darwin's mm -hmm. conversation with the missionaries. Um, can you just complexify that a little bit? I mean, is that, is that just, yeah, where is that in your story? Um, I'm not sure where it is in my story. Um, you know, to be sure, one could be, you know trace a series of theolo theological right traditions where um, uh, you know kind of the Christian origins of um, the centrality of humanity right are feeding into um, emerging ideas of what the what the human might be. Um, there are. Um, you know, materialist theories that um, I think, you know, might enter into a certain kind of leveling, right, of the distinction between human and other f sorts of entities. Um, one could go to Spinoza to be sure for this. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting about some of the philosophical um, theories that have been emphasized in uh, discussions of uh, radical philosophy is the ways uh, materialist insistence on the nature of the human as having, um, as being, a, 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 say, a, a corpuscular theory uh, in the new science, right, of the way humanity is constituted of, um, of material, is that uh, those kinds of questions start to look quite different when one does think about them vis-a-vis -vis the slave trade or vis-a-vis -vis the actual treatment of humans as, as material. So um, there's a sense in which. Uh, um, a lot of the theoretical considerations in the 18th century are leveling some of the distinctions between human and animal in a way that then forces a theorization of precisely that distinction. Um, you know, natural history is, you know, burgeoning as a discipline in the course of the period, new modes of trying to um, describe the nature of, to classify the profusion of nature, and to do so not necessarily from a template that's divinely um, guided, but from, a, you know, a, a codification of empirical observation. Um, there's a reinstitution of the site from which one should be describing the order of the world in the, in, in the 18th century that I think is quite central. So, critical rupture. Um, please, Mr. Actually, I've sort of been thinking about some of these questions and the questions have you know, sort of you know, changed over time, trying to integrate some of the different speakers uh, on the panel. Uh, but basically, I wanted to just uh, ask a question or raise uh, a point regarding the connection between the term or concept of humanity and humanness or human nature. Uh, uh, because it seems to me that separating the two uh, can, can sort of create some problems. And this is sort of what I'm thinking about. I'm a psychologist by, by trade. Um, and understanding human nature in terms of how we behave, whether as individuals in the community and society, I think is really imperative. The better we understand how we behave and the laws that govern our behaviors, uh, it's absolutely indispensable in understanding how that might be connected to this idea of you know, humanity or ideals that Oftentimes, we tend to think about that transcends, you know, uh, our nature. Uh, so, for example, you know, this idea that one could simply dismiss the idea that you know, 500,000 children may be dying in Iraq, you know, during the uh, the first you know Gulf War, and Madeleine Albright, you know, so blindly just says that it is worth 500,000 children dying in Iraq. 
you know, for whatever, you know, purpose would serve, you know, the United States and the West that was supporting that kind of, you know, war. And then individuals sort of didn't really, and, and what I mean by individuals, I'm talking about myself, you know, the society, the, 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 the group at large, that that was not any, a compelling reason, moral reason, to make a change in terms of policies. And, and so the question is, how is it that we could just sort of allow that to happen when certain social policies have such a significant impact on human lives? And we talk about violence, that to me is violence. When children are dying because of certain policies that are being instituted by, you know, by governments or by a you know, group of people you know, in power. So understanding our human nature is absolutely indispensable in the connection to this idea of humanity, the transcendent sort of idea of morals. Well, uh, thank you very much. I, I, maybe I can, I can offer two related uh, reflections. Uh, one is about the word humanity. I, I haven't had a chance to look into this. It wouldn't surprise me if, if there are people on the panel or in the room who, who know the answer. But it struck me in the, the passage from Darwin that I, that I shared with you that, that the word humanity there isn't used to describe our species. Um, humanity is, is humaneness, a uh, kind of quality of mercy. Uh, and throughout the book, I, again, I've never checked this, but my sense is he uses man, you know, capital M, man, to, to refer to us. And uh, I, I don't know at, quite, at what point humanity moves from meaning the quality of being humane uh, in the sense of merciful to, to being the name of, of, of us. Uh, but but it, is, it is striking that it has that, that uh, usage. And at least, Stephen, in the, in the subtitle of your book in the British version, uh, I don't know if you, if you meant there to be ambiguity about that. You did. Uh, uh, that's one thought on, on humanity. Uh, the second is about, about um, Darwin himself uh, in, in the book reflects at one point on uh, the question that had been raised uh, by others in the 1860s about whether civilization was buffering uh, humankind uh, from the forces of natural selection in a way which was leading to the degeneration of our species. So uh, under the, the intense pressure of the survival of the fittest, there were any number of people who now survive and reproduce who would not do so. Uh, and so the question, he, and he, he acknowledges in full that we might be degenerating as a result of all the people that we're keeping alive in hospitals and in asylums and because of poor law charity. But he pulls back from saying that we therefore ought to do something about this and, uh, and re keep them from reproducing. What he says is that um, what is highest in our nature, uh, our, our, our powers of empathy, would be so impaired if we were to actually act in this way uh, that we would lose more than we would win uh, if we were to act so. So what he, what he says is that we just have to bear it but we have to bear the degenerative cost of keeping these people around because uh, our human nature, as seen in the evolutionary perspective, is such that uh, we, we would lose that which is most prized out of that process. Anyway, those are two, two, two reflections in response. Darwin's humanity. Um, Joy. <laughs> I have a question that probably is unfair because it takes you outside of the chronological scope, certainly for Lynn and probably for both of you. But I was struck listening to you talk. It, there is a, a, a kind of linearity, right, to the narrative. And I'm a modernist, so I, the stuff that I read, um, and I'm thinking about a lot of the stuff that is, you know, that, that leaned heavily on Agamben, to which Lynn may have an allergic reaction right now. Um, but that, you know, the metaphor would be more like a slinky than a Le Creuset, right? It would be more a sort of, um, reeling back, like reaching out and reeling back in of what the expanding circle looks like. So that people are getting defined into the expanding circle of humanity, and then others are, or some, some set might be getting defined out of that again. So um, people like Achille Mbembe or Francois Vergès are thinking about the ways that people come to be defined as inhuman, even in a modern context. And I, I'm just wondering, um, I mean, and I think for those scholars, they, they look more at the 
I think political economic factors that that shape that, and and you're both looking at more um, intellectual and and literary factors. But I don't know. I'm just sort of wondering what this, how the story goes forward from where you've you left off, basically. Towards in terms of inhuman or. Towards, uh, sorry, towards um, towards a place where the circle isn't expanding anymore, but it has these pretty radical contractions at moments and, and kind of stark contractions. Um, well, I think that one of the answers might return us actually to Cindy's question, right, um, of the operation of different uh, forms of labor <laughs> um, that are, I mean, that might be taking us towards a kind of um, uh, economic explanation once again, but um, the kind of rescaling of economic activity, right, which render, which I think is, is central to what you were saying about this notion of a slinky, um, presents a set of questions about how um, remote as opposed to proximate suffering becomes visible, um, right, and, and the degrees to which that permits certain forms of dehumanization to take place, right? What things actually rise above the threshold of visibility um, winds up being a byproduct um, of the kind of media resources that are able to relay back certain kinds of images and then also the institutional structures that um, shunt people into invisibility um, by dint of the you know labors that are, are being undertaken. Um, I mean, I think that there's also an important possible uh, you know, distinction that's emerging, at least in the in the materials that I've looked at, between the inhuman and the non-human, um, and that the non-human, right, is a certain casting out from the species, but the inhuman is used as a, a, a means of demonizing those who don't adhere to the kinds of positive beliefs about the nature of inhumanity, and that becomes a very powerful way of instituting um, political forces, right, that, that are then permitted to extirpate um, and even to annihilate those who don't adhere to them. And I mean, I think that that's part of what one witnesses in the terror, um, right, is that the colonization of the language of humanity winds up designating certain people as inhuman. So there's, there's a kind of sense in which there are structures that um, insidiously relegate people to the status perhaps of the non-human um, by dint of these kind of um, economic and political processes, but there's also an active sense in which people get designated as inhuman um, and then are driven into different situations. If you, if you, okay. um, I've been remiss because of this uh, speaker here. There's uh, a gentleman um, um, who would like to make comments on that side of the room. Yeah, I just wanted to draw uh, attention to the ways in which moving between the two has political efficacy. So I'm thinking particularly of the First World War where you get the phrase crimes against humanity used for the first time. And the issue with the expanding circle is, is precisely what you do with people who then commit behavior which you want to um, uh, characterize as inhuman. So the Turks in particular are characterized as having committed a crime against humanity. So the expanding circle, they then drop from the expanding circle in order to try to um, prosecute them for crimes against the Armenians. So this circle exactly waxes and wanes in this way. And you move between humanity as an adjective and humanity as a noun, depending on what kind of political project you're trying to advance. But it's certainly not a linear narrative. Um, and the language of evil uh, func serves in much the same way. Once you categorize somebody as evil, whether it's the Nazis, whether it's um, uh, Bashir al-Assad, whether it's um, Al-Bashir in Sudan, once you characterize them as evil, you drop them out of the expanding circle in some sense. Um, not non-human, but inhuman. Um, or, or anti-humans. Uh, can I just pick up on that? Yeah. Because, it, I mean, part of what it seems to me that the perdurable language of rights, right, and the preamble to the French Declaration talks about the fact that you need these things to be instituted in a kind of objective form in order to, they, got, they get forgotten. Um, so that they need a kind of ossified form so that we know what they are. And there's a sense in which the um, purported perdurability of rights, right, winds up covering over a kind of fluctuating status within the human, right? Um, so that there's a sense in which if we think about rights as actually retroactively designating a certain normative form of humanity by, by deciding what will be necessary for human flourishing, there's a sense in which that very fixity winds up actually becoming a cover story for some of the fluctuations in, in this designation of human, non-human, and human, inhuman. Yeah, I agree. There's a huge amount of politics involved in whether or not you qualify for 
um, uh, rights in this particular way. So there's very interesting stuff around the use of boarding schools under empire, mm -hmm. whether the Native Americans, whether the Aboriginals in Australia and New Zealand, in Canada, where you take the children away from Native peoples and then you give them a very particular kind of education in order to qualify them for um, their, to be um, uh, fully human and to have their rights. And then what you've effectively done is train them to be a labouring class for um, uh, the um, richer and uh, elite people for whom they'll now work. So. Okay. And indeed relevant to the distinction between the uh, inhuman and the uh, non-human, I think um, some debates in Europe today about the um, uh, humans and animal rights that the, uh, and that relationship that you've been talking about in which, uh, in which um, uh, s some uh, you know, immigrant groups and, and sort of traditional others within the European community um, and their practices uh, towards animals through halal, uh, for example, kosher slaughter are somehow um, made to do work um, that, that uh, serves towards um, asserting the inhumanity um, of the people who do it vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. the, uh, mm -hmm. the um, the souls of the animals uh, that are involved. So I think that's, that's a tension, perhaps a contemporary uh, case that, that picks up on these tensions. Um, I think the uh, lady over there and then... Um, just before you, just as a, as a coda to what you just said, uh, in, I think it's in the ellipses in the quotation I gave. When Darwin says uh, humanity to the animal is one of the latest moral acquisitions, he does so by way of contrasting the way that Brits treat animals with what he had seen in Tierra del Fuego. Thanks. So I think Stephen just asked my question in a different way, and what you just said just really emphasized it. So I'll just go over it in short, because I need to get it clear in my mind. Uh, we're asking about the human as a category which will be significant for human rights. And what I was wanting to emphasize was the human rights, the rights in the human rights rather than the human, and ask what it is that we really are thinking of when we think of rights. Uh, the discussion about rights, and especially human rights, goes on in the moral conversation, or we think of them as moral rights. And it's not always humans who are the question in the moral conversation. As you just said, there are other ways of being moral except for the way we treat human beings or what we think of human beings. I'm put to mind of um, Albert Schweitzer, for whom the greatest moral uh, thought was reverence for life. The question was ra rather than what we talked about today being sentient or, or capable of, of suffering or stuff like that, for Schweitzer it was life and anything from a blade of grass had rights, but he didn't talk about rights. That's the point, that it was reverence for life and we were supposed to recognize life and we had duties towards life-bearing beings or entities rather than they having rights. So I think there's something about the emphasis on the word rights that brings us back to the human. There's something tautologous, tautologous about saying um, human rights are those rights that we are entitled to as humans. You want to talk more about rights, and I'd love to hear about that. Uh, you brought it up a bit, and you talked about the, um, the sentiment that goes in, but I'm wondering why animals, on the one hand, or uh, machines, I find more students worried now at this point about computer rights the, the computer's rights, not to mention Hal, ages ago, than, uh, than animals, than those bearing life. So what is it that we have in that concept of rights that focuses on the human and then gets us talking about the human rather than just, not just, rather than beginning with the human and getting to the rights? So there's something about the moral concept of rights that has to get us around human rights. This is a, a big and important question. Why don't we take several in a row because we're running out of time? So first Stephen Pinker and then... Um. Uh, <laughs> a number of things. The, um, I did use humanity ambiguously in the subtitle of the British uh, edition of Better Angels of Our Nature, History of Violence and uh, Humanity. And I suspect, although I don't, haven't uh, done the uh, lexicography to establish this, that the use of humanity as a generic term for our species, I suspect was partly propelled by the increasing embarrassment of using the word man uh, to refer to homo sapiens because of obvious uh, concerns about uh, gender equity. But a good lexicographer could get to the bottom of, of that. 
Uh, in terms of the whether there's been a uh, an oscillation in the size of the circle, um, I don't see that there's been uh, much of a slinky, and I think it's important not to think of any possible criticism of human behavior as a kind of dehumanization. In particular, if we were uh, criticize the, the Turks for the Armenian genocide or put Nazis on trial, that is the very opposite of dehumanization. It's, if anything, it's closer to demonization, which is a separate dimension of denigration of other people. When we dehumanize someone, we put them in the category of animals or machines for, wh for whom, for which, uh, moral consideration is uh, irrelevant. If I've got, my apartment is infested by roaches, I don't put them on trial and then uh, hang them in a public execution, I just summarily exterminate them. When we put war criminals on trial, we're not dehumanizing them. Uh, we are uh, holding them uh, accountable and subjecting them to uh, the, the very human standard that they could have chosen otherwise. Now, there are cases of genocides that were motivated by uh, demonization rather than dehumanization, and historians of genocide often distinguish them. In, in dehumanization, such as the extermination of a number of native peoples just to expropriate their land, they were treated the way we treat uh, a, a vermin. They uh, were eliminated just because they were a nuisance. It was just raw you know, me means and ends. Whereas uh, certain other kinds of um, genocides and, and um, oppression were motivated by a very different kind of denigration, namely demonization, na namely this class of people uh, chose uh, evil and deserved to be punished. So a lot of the um, Soviet and Maoist uh, oppressions were more dehuman demonization than, than uh, dehumanization. Finally, the, uh, I appreciate, Gregory, your mentioning the um, Darwin's uh, attempt to uh, cite the uh, other races and ethnic groups as intermediate positions on some uh, evolutionary continuum. And I, I suspect you would know this uh, better than I, than I did, that since you can only really understand someone when you know who they're arguing against, he had to face, my sense is, creationists of his day who thought it was an embarrassment that there were humans and then there were non-human primates and they seemed to be totally different. And so for him it was a matter of scientific convenience if there were some kind of intermediate links today, uh, and that passage that sends a chill through our uh, bloodstream of as these other uh, races are exterminated, the uh, difference will be even more apparent. Uh, I suspect that what he meant was similar, something similar to what modern evolutionists mean when they're challenged to say, how come we uh, still don't see monkeys evolving and where are all the uh, intermediate links? And a modern evolutionist would say, well, there is continuity, just that all the intermediate stages are no longer with us. So we get the illusion of discontinuity simply because it's the uh, survivors at the ends of the twig tips that we see around us all of the branches that initially connected them uh, have gone extinct, and so a continuous process leaves discontinuous evidence for us. I suspect that in context, that's what that passage meant, although especially using the term extermination uh, with what we know about how that term was used in the 20th century uh, raises the hairs on the, on the back of our neck in a way that Darwin obviously could not have appreciated. And it also gives the, the question of continuity or lack of between humans and other animals does, I think, speak to the, very, the question at the very heart of this conference, namely, what is this conception of human rights? Peter Singer, I think, correctly notes that uh, if we hinge our uh, moral treatment on some notion of human rights, that leaves us in a very awkward position vis-a-vis -vis our treatment of animals. And whether there is some salvageable concept of human rights as opposed to the flourishing of sentient beings that we might want to uh, extricate from this moral discussion. Uh, the way uh, I see it, it's one, I don't know if I'd be prepared to make this argument, but there could be a defensible argument that we need a bright line somewhere so that we don't worry about the, the blades of grass and the suffering that we inflict every time we mow a lawn. Uh, and, you know, if it's not blades of grass, well, what about oysters, and what about oysters, not what about shrimp, and maybe plants do react to being injured, so maybe they are sentient, uh, in which case we would lead to the absurdity that we couldn't survive uh, by eating anything. But given that there has to be some cleft along the continuum from uh, other living things to humans, should the human-non-human -human split be the bright line at which we uh, don't 
make the deliberations for which Singer himself was pilloried, namely, what is the value of an individual human life? Um, that is a matter of um, kind of utilitarian deontology, if you'll pardon the oxymoron. Maybe the best way to preserve uh, or maximize human flourishing is to have some bright lines beyond which you don't go, and that since nature has conveniently given us a human-non-human -human split because all the intermediates have gone extinct, we should kind of exploit that, uh, that, that uh, shift as a, a convenient place to draw the line. But anyway, that's, I don't know if I'm willing to argue that, but it is at least one way of uh, uh, rehabilitating the concept of human rights in light of Singer's uh, criticism and criticism by other utilitarians. Lynn and Gregor, I think you both uh, gave us a tour de force with your uh, presentations. Perhaps you could, if you have anything you want to respond to in a minute. Can I each. just say one thing? One minute. Um, you know, going back to this question of the threshold, rights are correlated with duties. Um, and one of the ways that one might think about that bright line, right, is who has a capacity to actually engage in duties. Like once we move beyond enumerative traits, right, which do raise that question of the computer, right, um, right, the, the responsiveness, this question of duties, which is something that often drops out of our consideration of rights, um, but is a correlative um, in most theories thereof, might be something to focus on. Uh, so 30 seconds on two topics. Uh, <clears throat> on uh, the, 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 uh, what Darwin uh, meant there, and you, you read the passage exactly right about continuity and discontinuity. That said, I don't think calling it a matter of scientific convenience would, would, would be quite right as to why he uh, filled in the intermediate gaps in, in the way that, that he did. Nevertheless, I think uh, it's perceptive to see Darwin as arguing against creationist critics. Uh, who held, for example, that it was a problem for Darwinian theory that we find around the world technologically primitive people that have the most sophisticated languages. Didn't that show that we're all descended, more or less, from the perfect pair rather than up from the ape? So I think a, a, his argumentation is often against critics like that. Uh, uh, but to, to go back to the, both the first question and then the, the reflections you had at the end, uh, I can't be the only person who's frustrated by the philosophical choice between either a discourse of rights and duties and obligations or utilitarian maximization of flourishing. This has to be a legacy of 18th century ways of setting up the discussion. And my, my hunch is that if one could only go back to what it was like before those stabilized as the only two options, it might help us now in being a little bit more uh, creative about how to go forward. Uh, but uh, it, 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 neither option ever seems very, very satisfying. I think um, everyone would be very happy to join me in applauding. So